All right, good evening, coaches, athletes, and pole vault enthusiasts to August's pole vault coaching series. And tonight we're featuring Coach Rick Adig, um, and he's got a lot of information for us. Um, and so for those of you that are joining in, uh, sit back and enjoy uh, his presentation. He will be um, leading us through lots of uh, things from his experiences at the high school level, the college level, and many other levels. So uh, I'm going to um, let Coach Attig get right to it, um, and I'm going to welcome him to the stage, and we will let him take it over from there. So Coach Rick Attig, welcome to the Pole Vault Coaches Series. Well, thanks. Thanks, Joel, for inviting me to talk, and uh, I look forward to it. And... Uh, so I, I think, I know I have just a certain amount of time, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, but when you first, when uh, Joel first asked me what I'd like to speak about, I, I uh, there's a lot of things in the pole vault that I would, I would love to visit about with, with everybody, but it's, um, you know, a lot of times I, I, um, I get into, when I first started studying the pole vault, I really got into biomechanics. But the one thing I learned is that it doesn't really matter if you understand mechanics if you can't teach it. And so the, the teaching process, my first nine years of coaching was at the high school level. And, and I love coaching at the high school level. And, and um, I, um, but I learned a lot about what it takes for kids to learn. And so, um, so today's subjects just you know, trying to create a, a learning environment. And uh, that's kind of what I've found that when you, when you have your, some of our, the better athletes that I've had, we've always had that good environment for learning. And uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my PowerPoint. And uh, and this is, of course, I, I am now at Washburn University, um, and that's where I coach pole vault, high jump, and the multi events. Um, and uh, we, I do, I do my camps, and I, I love doing camps. We've, um, I've done, this will be the first summer, probably in forty some odd years, that I have not done a summer a summer camp. Uh, uh, so I've, I've enjoyed a little bit of uh, rest during the summer. But uh, anyway, but what we're going to do is really, you know, a lot of the ideas that I'm going to present really comes from years of just questioning my ideas and a lot of my methods. Um, the season will be over, and I just felt like, boy, these guys could have done better. And, and so I, I keep questioning what I've done. And, um, and I used my camps to gain insight on better ideas. And so, um, and I've done this a lot of ways, and I'll, I'll illustrate that here in a minute. But, and then what I do is I implement these with my athletes and, you know, other campers, uh, as I have, you know, camps later on. But, but what I've learned from all this is that a coach must teach an athlete how to think. They need to they need to learn the, the thought process they have to go to, through to make improvements and it's not just a matter of just do these drills and it's going to happen it, it really doesn't work that way so um, so what i did on one of my camps on the first day of the camp i did basically did a survey and basically what the survey was is I, I kind of asked them, what is your go-to? When you want to vault high, like Santa Meter or something like this, what are you going to go to? What's going to be the thing that you feel like is going to make you jump high? And so I gave them a, a list of eight things. And obviously, they're kind of like the phases of the vault. But one would be a pole carry, you know, just running faster, planting higher, jumping at takeoff, swing up with more power, pull with more power push off with more power and a better clearance. I, I, I didn't really want to get into technique. I just wanted to be, you know, what, what is it they feel like they have to go to? It's going to get them over a higher bar. And so what we found was the results of that survey 
especially for the first year campers, this is what we had. And they were asked to put these in priority. Okay, they would pick three, the most important things, and they would put them in priority. Number one was swing up with more power. Number two was pull with more power. So just pull, push, and clearance. Almost the exact opposite, almost a reverse order. Um, and then the last four was plant higher, run faster, good pull, carry, jump, and take off. And, and what we started to realize that if you are a beginner and you're watching the pole vault, what really does stand out in your mind are the first four things. It's, it, it's like what I would call the, the obvious technical components, things that really stand out in your mind. It's kind of like arching in the high jump, or, or you might get the feeling that a triple jumper reaches for distance. And so th these obvious components have a lot of influence over what the athlete wants to do. And what I found was when we looked at some of the, the ballers that had been to our camps before, um, they knew what I expected. So they would put a lot of the, you know, it looked a little bit better. Um, but when you watch them vault, you can still see some of these obvious components that just take over. And so, um, and what I refer to these last few are the more discrete technical the components, even though we know they're really important. Uh, a lot of times to the ballers, it's, it's still, um, but anyway, those are kind of how, what we came up with. So, what we did then is we evaluated their vault. We had them jump over five bungees. And normally we just start out with drills. But this particular camp, we, we had them take five jumps over a, a, a low bungee. And we just kind of, we wanted to evaluate their, their uh, vault a little bit. And so we, we found that about 50%, right around 50%, and the numbers really don't matter, but about half demonstrated a powerful straight trail leg. Okay, they had a straight trail leg, but about 85% of that 50% had a poor hip swing. Their hips just didn't move. Even though they had a good trail leg, the hips weren't moving. And, and most of them had a poor plant, and nearly almost every one of them had a non-existent takeoff. Um, and that may not be, well, anyway, we'll, but... So are we coaching the trail leg at the expense of a poor takeoff? And, and, I, and, and why is there a poor hip swing? I mean, we, it is very typical to see an athlete get stuck where their hips are down and their feet are up and they just have to, you know, do everything they can to get out of that position. And so we need to kind of see what we have to do to fix that. So, now, part of the reason I did this was we, we had coaches in our camp that would continue always wanting to just jump right into the swing up. So I, part of the reason I did this, I also wanted to convince them, you know, why we do it this way. And so when I talk about coaches, there, we would have coaches attending the camp and also have coaches that are like staff members. So I kind of did it for both. And... So what we did the first session, we emphasized the obvious components, the swing up and things like that. Um, so, but the first five jumps, we, we had the athletes stay upright, but they focus on the plant and takeoff. Just try to get a great plant and takeoff. We did that the first five jumps. Obviously I knew that wasn't gonna be enough, but I, I, I really wanted to make my point so the coaches would understand. The rest of the jumps, they focused on swinging up and, and trying to finish up on the top. Okay, the results when we watched the videos is that they initiated the swing ups anywhere from, from 0.2 to 0.5 seconds too early. Okay, the swing up timing was significantly early and it was 80% of the athletes that, that were there. The other 20%, the timing was okay. Wasn't bad. Um, and often they would squat poles. 
So many times when they anticipate swinging up, takeoff just doesn't happen. And so if their takeoff point was such that it, a poor takeoff would make the poles just kind of squat, giving you the feeling they're making the poles move, but they're just squatting the poles. And that's not, that's not how you want to make poles move. Um, second session, we emphasize the more discrete components. So most of the session we worked on, we stayed upright, but they did the, we focus on plant and takeoff. Um, just trying to get that down. The last five jumps, what I did was I was going to give them permission not to land on their feet. So what we told them was land on your back, but we, I want you to close off the angle between your top arm and your torso with power, close off hard. But that was at the last second and they were going to land on their back. Didn't talk about swinging up. We just said, don't land on your feet, land on your back. But at the right, the last second, I want you to close off of that top, a straight top arm really hard. Okay, um, the results from those videos, the swing up timing for a lot of kids was amazing. It, it, it timed out really well. Uh, swing up momentum was good. Their hips finished and uh, at the point they were ready to invert, their hips were higher. And many, many started actually closing off about mid swing. Okay, they started, I wanted them to finish right when they're ready to invert, I wanted them to close off. But what you would find is a lot of them would start closing that, that angle off mid swing a little bit earlier. Okay, which is around 0.15 to 0.2 seconds before inverting. Now, just like we said, when you anticipate something, you're, you're likely to do it early. And in this case, that works out great. Um, and you would see much better movement in the hips. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk about a little bit about real quick, go through the phases and I have a video that I want to show. Uh, but we just like most uh, phases, we, we talk about the approach plant take off in a phase that when I was the national chairman back in uh, in the early 90s uh, we got together with a group of some of the top coaches in the country and one of the things that we addressed was what do we call what we do after takeoff because there was a lot of a lot of people talking about using different terms um, we and I still like the phrase that it was not my uh, idea. Someone else came up with the idea of the, the word follow through. I really like it. And really what it does, it, it means that we are, once you, after takeoff, I want you to continue to follow through with the plant and takeoff. Uh, and it's going to be momentary. It's just, but we're going to follow through by reaching upward, follow through in the direction of your takeoff. Uh, maybe follow through at the takeoff position for a little bit, um, but we want to follow through with that. And because uh, so many times we rush into that swing up phase. So the follow through phase, I, I, I really like that, that phrase. Uh, and that, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, someone, I'm gonna have uh, a video here in just a second. Then we go into swing up. And at that point, we just felt like None of the coaches at the symposium liked, uh, liked the idea of talking about pulling and pushing. So we, we agreed and I still like the use of just the invert through release. It's the very last part of the, the swing up. We're inverting and, and until we release the pole. And finally clearance. Um, now I'm gonna go to, oops. Let's see. And this is a, I'm, I'm going to use a young lady, uh, her, her as an example for several reasons. You can see uh, from what I'm showing now and to the, to the outdoor end of the outdoor season, you can see some, how she has improved in certain areas. Um, but she is also a good example of something we're going to talk about right at the end. And it has to do with short run vaults. Um, but you can see that she is starting with a 
Oops. Nice vertical carry. Um, what I really like for the athletes to do, I'm gonna kind of bring her in a little bit closer. Uh, you can see her right in the middle. She is really driving. It's a powerful driving action. Um, and, but she was a gymnast and she's kind of towing. Uh, we, we really fixed a lot of this through mid indoor season and all of a sudden it started coming back. And, um, but good high knee lift. So we're looking at the approach. Nice drop of the tip, but then we're into the plant. Take off. And this is, I think this is a 14 foot pole. But you see her rise up a little bit before the pole hits the back of the box. And this is what I refer to as the follow through. Uh, we continue to reach upward and we continue moving in the direction of her takeoff. And she has a, has a pretty good takeoff angle. Uh, but this is, this is what we're looking for, to get a, a good stretch to set up a, a good elastic swing up. Um, but it, it took a while to get her to do that because normally when she would plant the pole, you'd hear this big thud because she is already thinking about swinging up and her arms are already creating forward pressure. So follow through. And we go into the swing up. Now, I, I'm gonna go through the phases here and I'll go back to this because we're gonna look at something else. Swing up, invert, invert through release and crash. Okay, what you're seeing is that she is dropping before she can push off the pole, okay? So those are the phases that we go through. I just want to make sure you kind of understood that. But she does a great job of this, but from high school and maybe even anyway, from high school, she was taught at one point to throw her head back. That becomes her go-to. That is what she goes to, to try to move her hips. And that, that cue has nothing to do with engaging the shoulders and the core to really draw them together to invert and to keep the hips moving. But you also see that didn't work for her. And she also tried to throw that right, that her lead leg way behind the arm. If you're off to the side, you'll see it just goes way back. Um, so one of the things, so the whole indoor season, we're focusing on plant and takeoff and never really do, do much to address the top because she had lots of problems with her shin. So we really had to work a lot on, on her approach and plant and take off. Um, okay. Again, it's right through here where gravity has its greatest effect on slowing the hips down. And if you disengage your shoulders, your, your hips aren't going to move. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it just gets stuck. She's losing momentum in, in her swing up and there's really nothing left by the time she gets to the top. She just drops off the top. Okay. Um, now we'll, we'll come back to her jump later on. Um, and it's a different jump. One of the things I like to talk about is positioning yourself to learn and trying to put the athlete in position to learn. And I get this term from Dr. David Cook, uh, who was also in on some of those the symposiums that we had early on. Um, and, but he, he, he always used the idea of you, you have to position yourself to perform. And I really like that term. And what we're, we talk about is you have to position yourself to learn. To, to learn, you must be engaged mind, body, and heart. And so if you're going to learn certain skills, you have to put your body in the proper position 
before you, before you can even do it. Uh, we have to put our ourselves in good emotional position to do well. And our mind, mentally, we have to be in the right position to, to be able to focus and, and learn new skills. So when you look at the things like physical positioning, and I, I came up with a little quote one day just off the cuff at, at practice at University of Kansas one time, and, and I basically told the guys, I said, you know, it was all, all my jumpers. I said, if you put your body in the right position and you give it the right cue, your body will do what you want it to. And it, it, they made fun of me saying, oh, you're a poet coach, you know, it rhymes. And, and so, but anyway, but there was a lot, lot more to that than what I, I really thought at the time. Uh, but if you're going to learn to sprint correctly, posture is critical. You want your posture to be erect. You want to, you want your hips in a good position. There's a lot of things about positioning in order for your body to learn it. Um, and also ankle position when you're trying to sprint. You don't want to point your toes. And sometimes when we, we tell someone to get up on their toes, it, it actually is a cue that might cause them to really point their toes. So sometimes that cue is not the best thing to use. And hip position when you're sprinting. Okay, so a lot of different things. And the posture has a lot to do with how you can actually plant the pole uh, and, and jump off the ground. So positioning means a lot. Um, the next one is, um, you know, emotional position. Our emotions supply endless amount of energy and determination uh, for a kid to practice or even compete. I mean, I have seen kids who have really aren't in very good shape, but it, it was amazing how many jumps they can take, partially because they were excited. Emotionally, they were in great position to take a lot of jumps. Now, sometimes it, 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 it may also have to do with what they're focusing on. So one of the emotions that creates lots of problems is dread. And if, if you've ever dreaded taking a final or something like that, and that you really were not prepared for, you, you, you would go in just kind of feeling sick and, and tired, you know, like you couldn't do anything. Uh, that's the way I feel when I go shopping with my wife, okay? I, I dread it. And so if I go in the mall, I, I have no energy. I want to sit down. Leave me alone, you know, because I, I know that 10 minutes means three hours. And so I'm, I'm already dreading it. So emotionally, I just don't have the energy to, to shop very long. Um, maybe they're, you know, an athlete could be disengaged. I'm, going back to dread, there's times when I work with kids and I worked uh, at a club in Kansas City. And I would, when we were working on certain things, especially working on the plant and takeoff, you would see in the eyes of a lot of those kids and their expressions on their face that they were dreading that. I want to, you know, like they really wanted to work on the fun stuff, but there's a lot of things that are really important uh, that we, we have to learn first to, to make those things even better. And, and when you see that in their eyes, you really aren't going to expect much, but a lot of times if a kid's dreading it, they don't understand why they're doing it. And I think that's where we got to, we got to take time to explain why it is they're doing certain things. Um, they could be disengaged. Maybe they're satisfied with how they're jumping and just kind of disinterested. I'd rather work on something else. Uh, fear or subtle feelings of insecurity. And, and a, to me, a great example of why a lot of kids cannot plant the pole well, and it's not so much late that they're starting late, is that they're pausing the movement of their hands upward because they feel more secure when the pole is in the box early. They feel connected to the box and that's what they want. The higher you reach before it hits the back of the box, the later it hits and the more, the more insecure it might feel. So, you know, that's the reason why, so, a lot of times you, you come up with drills, the drills we call over the tips. If you teach it correctly, it helps them get over that feeling of insecurity, of not feeling, you know, um, 
connected to the ground like they would like to be. Um, mental positioning, um, and this is kind of what I call the four C's of learning, and that is concept, cues, clues, and concentration. And so we'll, we'll kind of go through those things. And, and this, these are things that I feel like as coaches are really important. And when I first started, um, I'll go with the first one is concept. Um, one of the reasons why I love camps is because they can really learn concepts. And um, even when I coached at Raytown South High School years ago, we had, that's the school I was at where we had four 16 footers on the same team at the, that's the same year. Uh, we had six of them in seven years that jumped over 16 feet. Um, we would start the year out with a camp. Now it wouldn't be your normal camp. We, you know, some of the kids, they might end up staying overnight at a guy's house or something like that. That time I was only coaching boys. And, uh, but we would, we would have talk. We would explain why it is we're doing certain things. And it was amazing how, you know, a lot of the things which normally they would think is boring, but when they understood why, it made a big difference. So concepts are important. You know, what am I trying to accomplish with a high plant? You know, what I'm trying to accomplish is trying to get my, my, my hands as high as I can get them and continuing to reach upward before it hits the back of the box. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Then how are you, how are you gonna execute that? Then you get into the, the mechanics of the plant. Why should I do it this way? And to me, this is critical. And so at that time, when I was young, new at coaching, I just told all the kids, I said, you know, if you don't understand why we're doing something, I haven't done a good job explaining, ask why, okay? And, I, and if I can't tell you right now, I'll tell you tomorrow. Uh, but I feel like, I feel like athletes need to know why. Um, and so the next one are cues and it's a word or a phrase used to, to describe the action that you're trying to imitate. Uh, and I think a cue needs to create a mental feeling, a sensation. It should, a cue should be one of those things where you, if you close your eyes, you can feel the almost feel the muscles working. What mu muscle groups you're using, um, but you want to use that muscular action as a cue. Okay, so use some kind of cue that will that will sort of trigger certain muscle groups that you're trying to create a certain sensation. And I really feel like you need to cue the cause, not the effect. Now I do, and in saying that, I know I've used cues that really was more of, of the effect. Um, and, and it worked okay, but I found that it didn't work for a lot of people. And so, uh, so one of the terms that I use is closing off and closing off is, is where the athlete is trying to, is extending upward and they are trying to draw the top arm and their torso, okay, from, from the shoulders to the hips and from their shoulders to their arm, they're trying to draw those, they're trying to close off that angle. They're trying to draw those two segments together. Um, and eventually that, well, by doing drills, they they really can feel what closing off means. And if you do it right, it turns on the proper muscle groups and it will shut down the groups that we don't want to use. Okay, and, and I'll tell you a good example of closing off is, is I used to tell kids, get, try to get your feet up. Getting your feet up when you're trying to end, get upside down has nothing to do with the shoulders. And the shoulders are key to making the, the hips finish up and, and get up over your, uh, your, over your shoulders. And so trying to get you in this cue I used, and it just, it worked for one or two kids and that was about it. And I think it, it only worked because um, I think just luck that they were, they were actually doing some things fairly well. The, the third C are the drills and 
and a, a drill is a clue as to how the action should feel. So when we're doing drills, um, you know, we're trying to use the cue uh, sensation to trigger the action. And I really want the athletes to focus on the field. Not, not just, don't just do the drill. You know, like I said, I'd like to get 10, 10 good plant drills. And you'll see guys just out there, girls just going through the motions. I want them to feel it. I want them to be able to feel if their arms are extended before the pole hits maybe a wall, if they're going to do a wall plant. Uh, but I want them to feel, know what that, that action is feeling like. Okay, and the more repetitions they use where they're really getting the feel for it, it literally breathes life into the cue. For all of a sudden that cue means even more, creates an even greater sensation of what they should be feeling. Um, and just keep in mind drills, just because you can do the drills doesn't make it happen. Doesn't make it automatic when you jump. Uh, you still have to concentrate when you're actually jumping. And so, the fourth C is, you know, the athletes, the concentration is just the athlete's ability to, to focus on a specific task. Um, and as basically when they're vaulting, they're consciously trying to execute the vault and doing and maybe getting their plan up or trying to spring, spring up quickly off the ground. Um, they should be seeking the, the, feel or the sensation that they felt in the drills, trying to get that same feeling. Again, when they're jumping, and this is where we use short run jumps, uh, we're going to do drills, we're going to do short run jumps, and <clears throat> to me, short run jump is a drill. It is not something you compete with, unless you're a, a very relatively new beginner. Um, but for a lot of athletes, you may need to reframe the technical objective, make sure that they know what the objective of, of what they're trying to accomplish. Because many times they have, they have the wrong feel. They may be going back to those, those um, obvious components of swinging up at takeoff. And we may have to reframe the idea that you're gonna reach high at the plant you're going to spring up so you're actually so that you're actually pushing the pole up towards the bar before they start thinking about swinging up. But just try to reframe the technical objective and feeling for them. Um, or one of the things you may need to do is is create incentives for for better concentration. And and so we'll we'll kind of get into those incentives. But it, for a vaulter to really be able to concentrate they need to adopt a narrow internal style of concentration and i'll kind of explain that um, there are four different things we're going to look at in terms of focus or concentration and one is a, a broad focus there some athletes need to have a very broad focus and that means that they are they they are aware of a lot of things a quarterback would be a good example when a quarterback is going back and sitting up uh, for a pass play, he knows who's rushing him. A good quarterback is aware of where all of his receivers are and where some of the, the main defenders are uh, in the secondary. So he has to have a very broad focus. A narrow focus might be like a batter, uh, softball or, or baseball, but their focus is very narrow. They are focusing on the ball. And some of those guys are so good that they can see how the ball is spinning, even see the laces and how they're spinning and what it might cause the ball to do. That's a very narrow focus. Then you have what's called an internal focus, and that is just being aware of what you feel, being aware of your body. External focus is what is outside of you. Okay, being aware of that. So. An internal focus might be, um, well, well, we'll kind of get into those, some of the combinations, um, but then external focus. Again, internal focus might be an athlete trying to focus on, on how they use their hips to throw the discus. 
Uh, external focus might be the crossbar and the high jump or pole vault. Um, but then when we combine these, a good quarterback is going to have a good, broad, external sense of style of, of concentration. And, and the more experience they have, the better they get at it. But they need a broad external. Uh, a good batter, they're going to have narrow external. They're going to really focus on the ball. Okay. As a vaulter, pure beginners, when you just when you just start vaulting, you're really, you're, you're not focusing on one specific thing, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of all the things that you're feeling, but just in general, you don't really get too specific right away. Okay, the narrow internal focus is what a, an experienced vaulter would like to develop, to, to especially to learn, um, some of their different skills. Um, so a narrow internal style of focus is what we're trying to do, but we have things that are competing with that that makes it difficult. Um, to use a narrow internal style of focus, we need to create a mental routine for every vault. And this is something Dr. David Cook, um, he was our sports psychologist at the University of Kansas and I, uh, our athletes spend a lot of time with him and he, he created this model of concentration and, and, and he offered it as an example for the uh, pole bowlers who actually these were the, at this particular year, it was our Olympic hopefuls or athletes who were, were on the Olympic team and some of the Olympic hopefuls were at this symposium and he was talking to them and, and uh, but one of the things he he, he created this model for concentration, and it looks like a pole vault box, okay? At first, the vaulter starts out with a very broad sense of focus. You know, do I have the right pole? Or, you know, am I on the right step before I get started? Is a crossbar up? This is a very broad focus. We're taking in lots of things. But as we get going, we start to narrow our focus. All right, now, what is my strategy? Okay, my strategy is, is, is reach high, and when I hit the box, keep reaching. Okay, following through with that plan and take off. That's my strategy. Then we want to feel it. Now we're, as what we're doing now is we're gradually starting to narrow the focus. Here's my strategy. Now I want you to feel it. Visualize and feel what it is you're trying to accomplish on this next jump. Then you go, okay? Now you might use a phrase, maybe you normally get tense, maybe the phrase, your go word is relax, but you go, okay? Or your, your term might be drive, maybe you get too quick at the start sometimes, and you wanna learn how to open up, and, and so maybe it's drive, maybe, but you could have a different cue, but you don't wait. You don't wanna wait for negative thoughts to start creeping into your head. And we want to get that feel of what it is we're trying to do right this next time. Because a lot of times the guys will have a horrible jump and they got to jump again. And all they can do is think about how they screwed up their plan. Okay. And so that's kind of the idea. But this is one way that we can start to narrow, narrow, <laughs> narrow our focus. Okay. Um, and a lot of times what I've done is create an on deck box at practice. And it could be on the other side of the runway uh, where you're away from your teammates who are talking about the day or, or joking about something. Uh, but when you're on deck, it's nice to kind of get away and sort of uh, kind of be thinking about what your strategy is and maybe even doing little simple drills to get the feel for it uh, before you actually step on the runway. Okay, so one of the things I found that makes a narrow internal style of focus difficult is how aroused or how excited you are in practice. And this is what happens a lot of times when we throw the bar up real high. Now, a water might jump really well. When I first started coaching, man, I thought I was a great coach because I could put the bar up high. And it, you would really get a lot of effort out of the kids. But they weren't learning anything. And so we, we, 
you have to be careful because what happens is with the arousal level goes up, your level of concentration goes down. Your, your focus goes from internal to external. Okay. And so what happens is your ability to perform the task or improve your technique goes down. Okay, if we, if we keep the arousal levels down, the pressure created by the bar or, or other stimuli, um, what happens is our ability to concentrate goes up. Okay, our ability to develop the task, to learn the task or do the task correctly goes up. Once you've mastered the skill, as the arousal level goes up, your ability to perform goes up. Now, you can get overexcited, okay? And to where it actually might work against you. But anyway, this is, this is kind of how it works. And so there, there comes a time where you want to get, get athletes prepared. So one of the things that can be done in a practice to also help develop this, this uh, narrow internal style of focus is that we might do, um, we do our practice without a bar, we'll do our practice session in, in, we'll focus on three different things. We start out with the approach, we, the next thing we work on is plant and take off and finally finish up with the top. And so at first what we do is I, we might say, all right, I want your first five jumps we're going to work on spinning into takeoff. Now, I'll, I want to explain that cue. <laughs> if you've ever been on a treadmill, uh, one of the Woodway treadmills that's not motorized, and what it is that the treadmill, the belt kind of goes uphill. And as you, as you, the more uphill you're going on the treadmill, the faster it spins. If you're, le if you're on the level part of the treadmill, because the, the treadmill has a curve to it. As you work your way up on the curve, the treadmill, the, the belt just moves faster and faster. And what we have found is that with this belt, to, to really move it fast, you have to run mechanically correct. And so what happens when we're, when we're running, sprinting tall and barely tapping the ground, and, and getting our knees up and doing everything like you should, that belt just spins faster and faster. So the term, the cue, spin, means something to them. We're trying to spin that belt. And uh, if, if that belt were to stop, what would happen is you would just start moving and you would move faster when you're working, you're actually spinning into, into takeoff. So that's kind of what it means. We're in a very tall, uh, tall position, barely tap on the ground, knees high, and just uh, finishing in a quick, very quick movement. Okay, so so the first five, they may work on that. Um, now, some people might be working on different things uh, when they're when they're doing the the spin spin and takeoff or the approach. Uh, then we go to the five, get five really good plant, uh, plant takeoff. Where we'll, I, I like to, it's hard to really work on just one. They, they both work together. We might get five where they're focusing on reach up, spring up. Okay. Um, get five of those and maybe five at the end where we're working on dropping and closing, dropping the shoulders and closing with power right at the end. At this point, we're not working early into the swing up. We're trying to figure out what it is that makes the hips move. And I, I find it's easier to do it at the end than it is early, because that's where we start having problems. This, this is good to do early season before using the bar. Uh, each athlete might be working on something different, even though they're doing the same phase. And as a group, what's really cool is, is try to get, see how many people can do can do it correctly, or at least what they're focusing on, and see how many people can do it correctly in a row. So if you have five people and you're doing five spin, spinning into takeoff, perfect would be 25 in a row correctly. But you kind of put the pressure on them to focus, okay? 
and you make a big deal out of it if, they, if you're getting a, you got a new record of having 15 in a row where the, everybody's doing things correctly. Um, but then the next one are called PhDs, which stands for progressive height drill. Uh, the first 16 foot vaulter I coached at, uh, at Raytown South High School, um, he was a, as a junior when I coached him, and I, I started with him as a sophomore, but as his, his junior year off of 16 strides, he jumped 14 6, Griffin 15 3. Um, I wasn't doing a very good job with getting him upside down or inverted. And so what we did is we focused on, we had a drill to give him the feel. Then he had to, then what he had to do is he had to do it five times without a crossbar. Zero means no crossbar. He had to do it five times correctly before we'd even put a bar up. Okay. And this is a 14, six baller. Once he got five, and that was pretty easy for him once he kind of got into it. We put the crossbar up, and this is off 10 strides. We put the crossbar up at nine feet. Now, most 14 6 volleys would be pretty upset that they're jumping at nine feet. I said, well, let's see how it works. His first five jumps he took, it was horrible. He, it didn't even resemble what he did without the crossbar. His focus was shifting externally not internal. Then he got the feeling, he realized that I'm in business. We're not going to go to anything higher until he gets five. And then five in a row, he got nine feet. Then I think he had, if I remember correctly, it was maybe four and one. Uh, he ended up getting five, but he had one, one done incorrectly at nine, six. Then we went to three over 10 feet, two over 10, six, one over 11 feet, and then that mean that first day he, he got his PhD, okay, uh, for that partic particular skill. And what happens is now the next time we came back, we started at 9-6, okay, then finished up 11-6. And within about three weeks, he was jumping 14-6 off of 10 strides and, and gripping probably about 13 eight or something like that. So he was getting a, a push off. Okay. Um, but I don't like to do a lot of short run jumps, but he learned a lot from that. Um, but if you're going from long runs, uh, might be somewhere we do two at 11, one at 12 and maybe one at 12, six, something like that. Or it could be a two, two, one, one. Uh, it, it could be just about anything, but, but we want them to focus on doing their skill correctly, or it doesn't, they can make the bar, but they, if they did it wrong, it doesn't count. So the baller must earn the right to vault at a higher bar by completing the task. So the plant, the task might've been a, a good plant. Okay. And, and it could be inverting, whatever it might be. Um, but you, each kid has a task and it may be something totally different. Okay. Um, in the next practice, obviously we start a little bit higher. Now, uh, I'll get into this. And one of the reasons is, um, the, the role of you of short run jumps. And I, I like, uh, short run jumps. I do not do anything less than 10, 10 strides or five less. Okay, or six left. I, I, I do, you know, I just don't like anything shorter than that. Um, so our five or 12 strides or five lefts or six lefts or 10 or 12 strides, however you, you say it. Um, we do it for drills, to learn things, to put our drills together in a vault. Uh, but I do not like doing it for maximum height or competition, unless, like I said, if it's a beginner. I, I wanna make sure that before an athlete uses more speed, that they are ready. They have a good plant and take off to handle it. Okay, what I found is what is effective for a slow run, a short slow run, is wrong for a long fast run. 
In other words, if you want to jump high with a slow, short run, uh, you're going to have to change things. You're going to have to do things different than what your ideal technique is. It's not a good thing to learn. Uh, the tendency of, a, of doing a lot of short run jumps is the athletes would normally use a shorter, quicker, less efficient stride in their effort to run a little faster with a short run. Okay, they learn a very inefficient stride, uh, a stride that's going to help that they're trying to develop to hit maximum speed at some point. And commonly they will struggle moving to longer approaches. Okay, long approaches are less efficient. And lots, a lot of times their, their long approach could be less efficient due to the habits they've developed from trying to run fast in the short runs. And a lot of times I've found that if you're gonna get a good swing up um, from a short run, since you're not creating as mu very much momentum on the runway, um, unless you just try to sprint real fast, which can be ineffective, um, you're going to have to force the swing up a little bit more to jump high with it. And I think you're going to learn bad things. Um, okay, now the female, the female vaulter that I showed you earlier, we're going to go back to her, um, something she was doing at the end of the outdoor season. But she always struggled with using anything more than 12 strides, primarily because that's what she did mostly. And she wanted to jump high off of those. So she rushed her sprint. She hit a quick rhythm. She never got into a really nice open high knee stride, unless she was wanting to just kind of prance up and down. Um, and she forced her swing up. And so when she came, we really had to try to change those things. Um, and so she always did, did short run jumps. She try, I think maybe, maybe one meet she was able to go to 12 or 14. I'm not sure which it was, but she struggled going longer. And she had good speed. She's just not really able to, able to really use it. Uh, she vaulted well on short run jumps, but had very poor rhythm on the run. Her go-to to invert was throwing her head back and eventually trying to exaggerate throwing the, the lead leg behind the top arm, which I don't like to do. Not even in a drill do I like to throw the lead leg back behind the top arm. Because once it goes behind the arm, it's got to come back forward, which can cause a transfer of momentum in the wrong direction. So she had some go-tos that, that created some problems. Um, okay, so we're not really gonna talk about the phases, but uh, this means she's on a 14.6, I think it's a 155 or 60. Um, A little bit further inside than what she normally would take off at about that's about 11.3. She normally took off at about 11.9, so she's a little bit inside. Pretty good plant position. She has a nice follow through, arms drag back. Normally the bottom arm is, is extended but dragging backwards. She was very concerned that day on that jump about blowing through this pole. Okay, still had the good follow through. She starts to swing up about. But one of the things that she had, we had to get rid of her go-to. So one of her cues were from, from when she's ready to invert is I wanted her to close off the angle. Between the top arm, that's the segment of the top arm. And then now I want to close off that angle. I can't draw, but it'll, because it'll move the frame. Um, but we're trying to close off, close that angle off right there. Okay. 
when she first started working on this outdoors, I told her, I want you to watch yourself closing angle off. Now earlier, her head was way, way back. So in learning to make her hips move, she watched it. She watched it close off. So she knew what she was feeling. Okay, you'll also notice by the time she's ready to extend, her hips are much higher than what they were before. Okay, before her hips were like right down here, or well, maybe, oops, maybe just a little bit higher than that. But her hips at this point have moved to a much higher position. A okay, good position. And before she was she was dropping, before she could even let go. Now it's kind of about the same time. Uh, she was, you know, prior to this mate, routinely she was jumping 14 feet in practice uh, on her 14 sixes. But she got in the meet, she was just very concerned about blowing through these these poles. But but we, we focused on the swing up at first thing we started talking about as we got into the outdoor season, when we started working on the swing up was we're working from here up. We're working on the invert. We're closing off the angle. We're trying to draw. I like to think, talk about drawing the segments together. This we're drawing this segment. Oops. No, it's not marking. This segment, we're trying to draw those two segments together, trying to close it off. And I like using it rather than saying rowing because you're involving both parts of the body. So you, you, I find it in, helps to engage the, the core, the hips, and the arm, and the shoulders. Okay. Ah. Okay. Um, darn it. I was hoping to get about 45 or 50 minutes. <laughs> a little bit long. That's but, all right. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple questions that, and one of them kind of pertains to what you were just were talking about. So I'm going to start with that uh, question. And you, you talked a couple times in your presentation about closing off and you finished with that, that piece of closing off. Um, and I think you, you know, really gave a, a good explanation of what it is. Uh, you also alluded to some drills that you might do to help athletes develop that skill or that technique to close off better. Um, and I was wondering if you could, you know, elaborate on that a little bit, well, like some drills um, or things. You know, I mean, there are drills like bupkas that, that you can do on high bars. Um, we have one of those SIs that, that move on the wheels that uh, some guys have come up with. And, and then I have a, an SI device that I kind of created in at, while I was at the University of Nebraska that I really like. Um, and we, we have two of them, but I, I really like them. But I think for the beginner, just to learn as a concept, to learn how to do it, they can lay on the pit and, and do a, where their arm is straight up and someone is spotting, holding their arm while mm -hmm. they're trying to invert and close off. The, the, and they don't really need to have someone spot them, but the problem is they never learn to use the shoulders. And I think a, a, a doing a, an invert drill on the ground by yourself is giving you a false sensation of what it takes to invert. Um, when you're on the ground, you can do it by yourself. But what I'd rather have is someone holding that arm, and as they're trying to invert, you actually feel that they're trying to draw the torso and the top arm together, trying to draw those two segments towards each other with lots of power. And what will happen is the spotter will actually feel like they're getting pulled over. Um, on my uh, pole vault website, which is polevaultu.com, um, I have videos on there. It shows them 
we we did it on a pit, but they also did it on what I what I call an invert box, where they actually drop their head into like a hole, and they would invert and go up against the fence, um, and it worked out perfect. Uh, but it really teaches them how to engage the shoulders properly. But a spotter is important because, um, or especially a coach, spotting them so you know that they're they're actually using their shoulders uh, to spot them. And, um, and, and if you put that invert box on a slight slope, then they really do have to use, they really have to use their shoulders. A lot of times kids aren't strong enough right off the bat to, or they don't know how to use their shoulders to invert like when they're on a high bar or like our SI device and they just have to learn how to do it first. Um, but those, the invert box, I, I really like that teaching that concept. Perfect. Um, the other question that I had for you is um, with your, your PhD, um, training piece, um, you gave an example of a 14, six jumper. Um, how do you determine that starting height? Do you, well, I, I know that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to move out of the lower heights pretty quick. A lot of times I try to go at least three feet below their PR, uh, three to four feet below their PR. And it really kind of depends on on how, how deeply ingrained some of their habits are. But first of all, I wanna see them do it on a pole, short run uh, with, without a bar. That, that way I know they know how to do it. But what's amazing, you put that bar up. Now, I had a guy who was an 18 footer and he had some problems we were working on and he actually started at 13 feet. You know, the first PhD we did with him, you know, after he jumped 18 feet the first year. Um, but that's how we started the, the, the fall season out and um, training season at pretty low. But, it, but he advanced up pretty quick. And then um, with, sorry, with that is... Four feet is what okay. I usually go with on a short run. And then are, are you, are they changing poles through this process or are yeah, they... Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, what I do is, um, is each jump... I, um, oh boy, um, let me do something here. Ah, okay. Well, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can master this. Um, <laughs> let's see. We'll create on a on a marker board or something will create dots <laughs> I'm trying to make a dot i could probably yep. do that a little better but i might put dots okay and then what i do is every time they take a jump they either get a smiley face or a frown okay if they clear the bar and do it correctly they get a smile over the dot okay if they cleared the bar which could happen but they did it wrong they get a frown okay yeah and so if you're doing like a two two one and you're on the phd to get two they got to get two smileys over the the dot like i said this is just a dot i couldn't yeah probably could go something make a dot but uh but we're and so they could do something like this they might do it correctly but maybe they blew through the pole Pole's too small, just took them right through it, but they finished up really well. Well, what we're looking for is to come back and get two of these before they go on. Okay. And sometimes we give them a limit. If they if they get so many wrong, then they kind of have to drop down to that lower height again. It just depends on, on what we're doing. Yep. Um, but that's kind of how we do it. And sometimes if they 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 blow through, we, we might use a, something like this that just, or, or we'll put the smile that goes through the dot so we know that they blew through it. And that just kind of for our records. Um, yep. Sometimes I count it, sometimes I don't. <laughs> so anyway, but that's kind of how we keep record. Yeah. But 
but we're looking for them to get that test. Now, one of the things I found at the high school when I first started doing this is all of a sudden kids would get into meets and they say, coach, it's amazing how I can, I'm, I, I can feel what I'm doing. Used to, it was just like, they were just like going blank. Yeah. Uh, but they're really, cause I would, I would never tell them what they did wrong. I would say, how did your plant feel? Okay. And I would try not to, if it was a really good one, I would try not to get excited. <laughs> You no, know, just very, fairly calm. How the plant feel? And they say, "Man, it felt really good." Then I could smile and and, and celebrate. But, um, but I didn't want them to, you know, kind of answer me by by my uh, expression on my face or something. Yeah. That um, makes sense? Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question we have is: What are some of your top drills for uh or practices for run and takeoff so you focused a lot on um and and rightfully well, so the run and the takeoff are a huge component of this um okay. so what are some of the things that maybe well, i mean it, it, i'll set i'll 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 not include the approach right now unless unless that's a question but i really like the the what i call over the tip drill um Istvan Bagula, some of you guys remember him uh, from George Mason. And we had a couple guys at KU we thought were going to go first and second at the NCAAs. And here comes this guy. Where was he from, guys? I, I, I muted them all. I so. know Bulgaria, or I, I don't remember where he was from. Pat Manson would remember. Because um, he got Hungary. He got spanked by him. He's there from he Hungary. Is. Hungary. <laughs> Hungry. Okay. Anyway, I was watching this guy do drills and he did this over the tip drill. If anybody knows what it is, you're just, you're, it's a straight pole and you, you know, you might be running down the, the track and you, you, you're going to do a plant drill on the track, but you're going to jump off the ground and he would do that. And I swear the guy's on like a little 13 foot pole or something like that. He was gripping pretty darn hot. And he would just come down and all this quicken up and all of a sudden spring up off the ground and it seemed like it maybe took a second before the pole tip hit the ground because he had this great takeoff angle. And, and then he just stayed upright in, in, in takeoff position and then he lands on the ground and then he just runs out, swings a pole overhead, does another one. And I'm thinking, holy crap. So I'm, I'm watching then he gets into the meat and he's just, just an amazing takeoff. Now I would say that probably he definitely a little bit, I think he lost momentum. I think he, it was definitely over striding to take off, but, but it's, I like it in that he knew how to do it. And I think you can work your way out of that more easier than you can to get a guy to actually jump off the ground if they haven't done it before. But, Anyway, so that over the tip drill became, it, it has progressed and evolved for me over the years. Um, but we really would focus on what I like to have the guys do is a focus on a jump touch where they're going to, they're bringing that plan up, they're reaching high and they're going to spring up off the ground without it touching the ground. What we're trying to do is get them over the, the, uh, feeling of insecurity of not being connected to the ground and you'll find kids will, will they will pause they'll let it touch the ground then they'll do it then they're fine but they want to feel it on the ground first so you have to get them over that and that's to me is one of the big objectives of the over the tip drill um and i again i think that's also on that drills video that i had but that that is what i like and, I, and we we do it a lot of different ways. We'll also do it. We have really short poles that we use for this so that we can almost grip the top and we can do a vertical carry with it. And we'll time out the drop of the tip to determine, you know, our plant and takeoff time timing. Um, so we do a lot of different ways, but we also do it in a way that I really like is, and we'll work on spinning into the takeoff, but, we will just pick a spot 
Okay, we do a, we use hula hoops and we'll throw the hula hoops all over the field and they're gonna run towards that hula hoop, time out their drop into the hula hoop, and then they're gonna do over the tip drill with their tip in the middle of that hula hoop. Okay, so no, no steps, they just learn how to adjust. Uh, then we will do that at the pit when we're actually in the box, we do what we call over the tips. We'll put a lid on the box and do over the tips. And then we'll take the box out, razor grip about seven hand grips up. And now we're doing over the tips with the pull in the box, but we will go from various distances. So we might go anywhere from 40 feet to 60 feet and we'll just pick a number. All right, everybody go from 45 feet and they'll, they'll go from 45 feet. You'll see them adjust and they, they take off and it's, but that just helps them actually work on a, an instinct uh, that is kind of built in, you know, their ability to steer or to target something like that. Awesome. Um, one of the other questions you talked a lot about, you know, developing the athlete. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I have for you is, you know, maybe we've had some coaches talk about in the past, but like in, in meat coaching strategy, maybe some things that are your go-to's, for uh, communicating with your athlete um, or um, just in meat coaching tips that you might have? Well, um, yeah, and I know that this, this kind of varies. Um, I, I think that when it comes to starting the meat out, the only drill that I, we might do might be like an over the tip drill uh, on the field. Um, I don't necessarily like doing them on the track just because it's kind of a hard surface to land on on their feet. Uh, I try to protect their shins a little bit, uh, but we. Um, but but once you know once the the pit is open, I, I really like for them to use their time on the runway, especially if there's a lot of ballers. Um, so I like for him to be able to step on the runway and get going. Um, so, but, and I, in, in terms of, of, of cues and things that we focus on in the meet, uh, it really depends on where that the athlete is at that level early in the year. Um, we're probably, and well, I'll first say right off, we work right from the start of the season, we are working on our long run approach. So high school, it might be 16 strides, or maybe some might be doing 18 strides, um, you know, eight or nine less. Um, and we're always working on, we're tra that's our training uh, that we're doing all the time. And we may not use it for a while where we're working on plant and take off, things like that. But early in the season, we, we start out working on plant and take off, plant and take off. Um, I, at that high school where we had all those 16 footers, there was two weeks into our season before we ever saw a crossbar in practice. And we're just really trying to get things down. And um, cause we didn't have, um, we didn't have an indoor facility. So there was times when we could do some things indoor, but it was very, very rare. Um, but we might, we'll really focus on plant takeoff. So the first, first meet we go to, uh, we might be, um, the beginners might be on a 12, 10 or 12 stride, but the, the kids who have jumped a year or so, we're on either 14 or 16 strides to start with. Um, and I don't want at the end of the season them to have to go through a learning curve to get on their longer run. I want to I want to start it, and they'll just continue to develop and get better and better at it. Um, but we might the very first part of the year we are focused still focused on what they're doing prior to and after plant and takeoff. We're focused on plant and takeoff and trying to follow and trying to follow through. But that all. Follow through has all to do with the direction of pressure with your or effort with your hands and feet at takeoff. So we get in there a lot of times and our, uh, their focus is 
what I what we call a soft plant is where their hands are as high as they can get them and as soon as the the pole hits the back of the box their hands are already starting to drag back what happens is it has a softer sound in the box so we get a high sometimes we'll say a soft plant we're really wanting to reach up um, and so that might be the focus in the meat and so and of course I'm, I'm always aware of, of approach issues and things like that if their steps are on you know looking at those types of things I, I use mid marks um, and find that they're extremely helpful to, to know but um, but if, if they're, I mean, I, I, you know, at the first school I was at, and, and even from that point on, if an athlete for their standards were at 24 inches and they had a poor plant and they came up short, I didn't move the standards. They, the standards stayed, they had to do it right. So the, the pressure was on them. I mean, it was, now let's, now we got to develop this internal that narrow internal style of, of focus. And so it, it forced them, held their hand to the fire. Um, and that's one of the things I don't like just using the standards as a crutch. Um, you know, if they're learning to do things right in practice and they get in the meat and, and they've come up short because they had a, a poor plant um, or takeoff, we're going to make corrections. We're going to learn to do the technique right. And after doing that at that that first that high school I was at, I remember one time at a at a state track meet with this one kid. He came up short, and I thought everything looked good. And I said, "All right, why don't you move your standards up to like 21?" Oh no, coach. Oh no. It, it, it's like you're 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 questioning his manhood, <laughs> and and he said, "No, no, no. I'll I'll, I'll be okay. I'm no, I'm leaving there." I'm not, I can, I know I can run fast. I said, okay, we'll do that too. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, and it worked. He did, he did well, but it was like, it was a real, uh, it was a real put down for me to suggest that he moves his standards up a little bit. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned mid marks, um, and we talked about, let's say for example, a, an athlete has a, a run and a takeoff that is, that is not, um, what you're hoping for. Um, do you do a lot of off, off runway run and pull drops? Uh, what is, what's kind of your fix for that? Um, well, yeah, we, we do, like I said, you know, we'll start this season out. Uh, we'll go through a period of, of conditioning, you know, where we really can't do any specific skills, but during that time we are working on sp sprinting, and we're also working on the rhythm. We can't have a pull at that point. We're working on the rhythm of their approach. So we start strong, we, then we just, we drive out and we just gradually pick up rhythm and we will find our 16 or 18 stride approach for, for our athletes without a pull. So they are learning the, to develop the stride, the rhythm and all those types of things. Then when we're able to do some skills, then what we will do is we'll now put a pole on their hand and they will be doing their, their long run approach work over and over and over. And we will eventually put a, a sliding box down. And, um, and then we, a lot of times for kids that tend to take off under, we will use a takeoff roll where their takeoff is supposed to be and getting accustomed to staying behind that quick that roll and, and what we'll do is we'll make sure that they have to quicken up to stay behind that takeoff roll that's that's what you put on the runway that you're trying to stay behind yep. and we don't want them to step on it so uh anyway but but those are types that we'll do approach work like that and all along at at the pit we're doing uh, we, we, we're doing drills, then we go into our five step or our tens, what we call it, we just call it 10 stride vault. And it's a short run vault and it's just strictly for technique. And we will work on spinning into takeoff. Then we'll work on, you know, good high plant, whatever, but we'll work on different, different ways 
at the pit to really focus on what their, their, their technique is. And then at some point, we will we'll move back after about three to four weeks, we then move back to the, the longer runs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the girl I was talking about, what she did, she would, boy, she would start out really fast, really quick rhythm. And what would happen is when she'd go back to a, a longer approach, she would hit her top rhythm way early. And it just, it just felt like she, she just didn't feel like it was a good run because she, she just stayed at that same rhythm and her, her, her stride length was short and closed up. And it was just not, it was not a good feel for a long run. So whenever she would do her short runs and all our athletes, when they do short runs, they start exactly the way they do on their long runs. And, and we don't do 10 stride approach work. We only do 16 or 18 stride approach work. Uh, now for high school, maybe for some of the girls, we might do uh, some maybe 14 or 16. Guys, we might do 16 or, or 18. And, and, and I've had eighth grade girls doing 16 strides that, they were, that were pretty good athletes. And they would do, she would do a, had her doing 16 stride approach in practice and looked really good with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we wouldn't, uh, all right. So anyway, that's kind of, but when we get in the meet, our focus, you know, like I said, a lot of times plant and take off and they'll have certain things that they're focusing on going into the meet. Yeah. And that's, that's all derived through your very, um, your, your very focused practice sessions and talking about, you know, the plan and, and letting them know exactly what they're working on. So that's, I think that's a, a big takeaway from tonight's talk is, you know, as a coach, it's really important to allow the athletes to understand why they're doing what they're doing and uh, having them feel what they're doing so that they can, when it gets into the meet, you as the coach really don't have to do a lot of work. You just uh, are there for moral support. Exactly. I mean, when, when an athlete gets a feel for what they're doing, and I, I think this, uh, doing the PhDs like this really helps um, is it, they're, they're so much more aware. And so many times when you ask them why it felt that way, rather than just tell them what they did wrong, so they don't have to think, um, they, they start to become a little bit more self-sufficient. And that's, that's one of the things you want to strive for. You know, it, you're, um, and I, I really like kids who are, who are wanting to learn and going on, you know, I, I tell them, let's, you know, if, if you watch videos and you know, learn from some of these other coaches, but let's talk about it first before you start just on a whim trying to do something, you know. Whoops. Did I lose them? All right, so uh, that was a, quite an abrupt exit um, for Coach Adig, um, but we we were getting to a close there. So I'm going to take the opportunity to thank him and see if I can connect with him uh, after this. But I'm going to close the um, YouTube Live session and thank everyone for tuning in on YouTube Live. So thank you again to those coaches who've tuned in on YouTube Live, and we will uh, see you in September, uh, probably the second uh, Wednesday of September, uh, for another installment of the Pole Vault Coaching Series. So thank you to all our viewers.